This is AP Calculus AB, and in this video, I'm going to talk about section 5.6 uh, related rates. And what we're going to do in this section is a lot of problem solving. So when we talk about related rates questions, obviously we're doing application problems, um, and clearly we are talking about rates of change. So when we take derivatives in these related rates problems, we're always going to be taking derivatives with respect to time. So notice the first thing I have here, it says finding, rate of, finding the rate of change over time. So the thing to remember about that is what we did when we were talking about implicit differentiation. So I have a really simple example here to start with, just as a reminder, um, when we are working through these kind of problems. So when we did application problems with optimization, we were taking derivatives typically with respect to x or whatever variable we had chosen. But the difference here is since we're talking about rates, we're always taking the derivative with respect to time. So here's a really basic example to let you know sort of how the mechanics of the calculus part of one of these problems work. It says y is x squared plus 3, find dy dt when x is 1 given that dx dt is 2 when x is 1. So notice my derivative here. I took the derivative of this equation, y is equal to x squared plus 3. So the derivative of y is dy dt. The derivative of x squared is 2x times dx dt. I'm using my chain rule. I did the power rule times the derivative of the inside, and then the derivative of 3 is obviously going to be 0. So then when I uh, want to finish this problem out, I'm looking for dy dt. So now I'm just going to go in here, and I'm going to substitute in the values that I know. So I know that x is 1, and I know dx dt is 2, so that's going to give me a value of 4. Okay, so fairly simple. Um, that's really the majority of what we're going to do from a calculus perspective on these problems. Now, a lot like um, the situation that we ran into when you guys were solving the optimization problems, the hard part on these questions is not going to be the calculus. The hard part on these questions is always going to be the setup, getting to the point where you can do the calculus piece of it. And then after that, a lot of times there's going to be algebra that you have to do to solve for whatever you're trying to find. Most of the mistakes that people tend to make on these problems are not on the calculus steps. It tends to be on all the other parts, you know, just like with optimization, algebra, uh, geometry, stuff that you did in pre-cal, including trigonometry. So those are the main things that are going to show up in these questions. Okay, so here's the first example that I want to go through. The radius of a sphere is increasing at a constant rate of half an inch per second. When the radius of the sphere is 15 inches, at what rate is the volume of the sphere changing? Okay, so the first thing I typically am going to do on these problems is I'm going to draw a diagram. In this case, it's very simple. It's a sphere, we've got a radius of r. It's not really necessary to draw a diagram when it's this simple. Typically though, just like with optimization, we will draw a diagram to make it clear what the problem is and then also make it clear what our variables are. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write down my given information. So up here in this initial prompt, they told us the rate of change of the radius was half an inch per second. So I'm gonna write that down just as a reminder, notice I wrote it as a differential expression. Their change in the radius with respect to a change in time. Now, another piece of given information that's not directly stated, but it's definitely implied, is the fact that we're talking about the volume of a sphere. So I'm going to assume that that's given information, 4 thirds pi r cubed. Okay, so not stated given information, but implied given information. And I also want to write down, what am I trying to find? Well, we're trying to find the rate um, the volume of the sphere is changing. So I always write down, what am I actually trying to find on this problem? I'm trying to find dv dt, and I want to find that when the radius is 15 inches. Okay, so I've got my volume formula. I know I'm looking for dv dt. I also know what dr dt is. Now, I only have a single variable here, and I can see that when I take a derivative with respect to time, I'm going to end up with a dr dt, but I know what that value is, so that's not going to hinder my ability to solve this problem out. So I'm going to go ahead and start solving this. Remember, we want to find the rate of change of the volume. So I'm taking the derivative of that equation with respect to time. dv dt would be equal to, and now on the right side, when I take my derivative, I'm going to start with the power rule. That's going to give me 4 pi r squared 
times the derivative of the inside, which would be the derivative of the radius, so times dr dt. Okay, so that's my derivative. Now, that's my relationship. dv dt is rated, uh, related to dr dt by multiplying dr dt by 4 pi r squared. So that's how the rates are related together. And that's where the name of these problems comes from, related rates. Okay, so now the last step. I want to know dv dt when radius is 15 inches. So I'm just going to plug that information in that I know. I know that the radius here is 15. I know dr dt is 0.5. And from that, I'm going to end up with 450 pi. And then for my units, we're talking about rate of change of volume. Notice that our volume is in, um, or our measurements are in inches, and then our time units um, are in seconds. So it's going to be inches cubed per second. So that would be my solution. Now, there's a couple things that I can check here. One thing I can check are my units. And that's an easy, quick check to do. So notice that with the units I have with the 15, that was in inches. That's being squared. And then the 0.5 was in inches per second. So if I multiply those units together, I'm going to get inches cubed per second, which is what I'm expecting. So that's one thing I always check. Because if my units aren't matching up, then I know I've made a mistake somewhere. The other thing I want to think about is, does this seem like a reasonable answer? That's a little bit harder to quantify when we're talking about the rate of change of the volume of a sphere, but we want to make sure we don't get something that seems completely out of whack. Like, for example, if I got um, 5,000 pi inches cubed per second, that's a gigantic number um, compared to the rate of change of the radius that I have and the size of the radius that I have. So we want to make sure it seems reasonable. Okay, so let's look at the second part of this question. So the second part of the question says, when the volume and radius of the sphere are changing at the same rate, what is the radius of the sphere? Okay, so let's think about what we want to find here. So we want to find the radius, and we want to find that when the following statement is true. We know that if this is going to be true, we want it to be the volume, the rate of change of the volume, and the rate of change of the radius are the same. Okay, so a little bit different type of problem than we saw on the last one. Um, however, we already have a relationship between the rate of change of the volume and the rate of change of the radius. Remember, we found that right here. That's how our rates are related together. So I'm going to restate that here. I know dv dt is equal to 4 pi r squared times dr dt. And then the last step here is I want to find the radius. So I'm going to try to isolate my radius. I'm first going to divide by dr dt. So dv dt divided by dr dt. Should be equal to 4 pi r squared. Now remember that we set up here that dv dt is equal to dr dt. So if I divide a quantity by the same quantity, it's going to give me a value of 1. So that's going to simplify down to 1. So essentially what I have here is 1 is equal to 4 pi r squared. And that tells me essentially that r squared is 1 over 4 pi. And from that, I can get my radius to be the square root of 1 over 4 pi. And again, I have units here because um, the previous part of the problem gave me units, so I know that would be in inches. Okay, so again, we can kind of think about, does it seem reasonable, um, the radius that we got? Yes, it seems reasonable based on what we were looking at before with the sphere with a radius of 15 inches. We could go through and kind of simplify down that radius. It's definitely a small radius, but it's not negative, number one, which is a big thing, and it's not overly large, which is another thing I would be looking for. Okay, so that's kind of the main idea on these questions. Now, a lot of these are going to be more complicated than this, but that's sort of what we're going for when we solve these problems. Okay, so in general, 
Remember when we talked about optimization problems, I told you you can't really memorize how to solve every single problem because you've got a lot of unique situations that are going to show up. When we're dealing with related rates, it's the same situation. So there are some sort of typical related rates types of questions that you're going to see. But at the same time, I can give you an infinite number of unique type of problems that are going to require you to do something a little bit different than what you've done before. So rather than trying to memorize how to solve every potential type of problem that we have, which we can't really do that, what we're going to do instead is just talk about a general process that we're going to follow. So in general, we're going to draw a sketch and write down what we're given. Then we're going to write down what we're trying to find. And then we're going to write an equation that relates the variables if we don't already have it. And then we're going to differentiate. And then once we have our rates related together, then we're just going to substitute and we're going to solve for whatever we were looking for. Okay, so here is an example that I want you to try. Very similar in difficulty to the one that you were just working on or that we were just working on with the sphere. So this one is talking about a cube. So it says um, the edges of a cube are increasing at a rate of two centimeters per second. How fast is the volume of the cube increasing? And then how fast is the surface area of the cube changing? So I want you to try those two parts so you can pause the video. When you come back, I'll show you my worked out solution and kind of talk through that. Okay, so here is my worked out solution. I made sure that I followed all of the steps that we were given as sort of our strategy for solving these problems. So I started with a diagram, even though a diagram's probably not really necessary here, but I have my diagram. You can see my cube has dimensions of X in every direction. My volume is X cubed. That wasn't directly stated, but I'm gonna treat that as given information. They also told me DX DT. And so what we're trying to find is dv dt when x is equal to 5. Okay, so I always write this statement. And I think that's a really good idea because it makes it really clear this is what I'm trying to do in this problem. I'm trying to find dv dt when x is 5. So that's all of my setup. And now it's just a matter of taking the derivative. You can see I took the derivative with respect to t. So I got 3x squared dx dt. And then just plug in the information that we know. We know dv dt when x is 5. Well, x is 5, and then dx dt is 2. So we end up with 150 centimeters cubed per second. And again, look at the units. 5 was in centimeters, so that's centimeters squared. 2 was in centimeters per second. So if I multiply those units together, I do get centimeters cubed per second. So again, that's a good check that you can do just to make sure that your setup um, and your solution is coming out the way that you're expecting it to. Now, on the second part, this time it was talking about the surface area of the cube. So each face of the cube is going to have an area of x squared. There's six faces on the cube, obviously. So that would be, again, I would consider that given information, sort of implied given information. We have area 6x squared. We're trying to find dA dt when x is 5. So again, notice I wrote down, this is what I'm trying to find. All right, so I took my derivative. dA dt is 12x times dx dt. Plugged in. Um, x is 5, and then my dx dt value to find dA dt at that particular moment, and I got 120 centimeters squared per second. And again, check your units. Um, check to see that the number seems reasonable. All right, so that's sort of the, the main process for these questions. And like I said, that's a relatively easy one just to give you a feel for how it works. Um, but what I want to do next is I want to show you one that's more of a typical level difficulty related rates question. And this one's a little bit more involved. So I will go through this question and then I'll talk about, you know, what to expect from the standpoint of difficulty when you're working through these problems. So on this problem, it says, suppose you're drinking root beer from a conical paper cup. The cup has a diameter of eight centimeters and a depth of 10 centimeters. As you suck on the straw, root beer leaves the cup at a rate of seven centimeters cubed per second. At what rate is the level of the liquid in the cup changing? And then we have two questions here. A, when the liquid is six centimeters deep, and then B, when at the instant when the last drop leaves the cup. Okay, so I'm gonna start by, we've already give, been given a diagram, so that makes this a little bit easier. So I'm gonna start by writing down given information here. So they told us that root beer leaves the cup at a rate of seven centimeters cubed per second. 
based on the units, I can tell that's dV dt. Now, the other thing you have to be careful with here is the volume is decreasing at that rate. So I want to make sure I put that in as a negative 7 centimeters cubed per second. Okay, so that's my dV dt. Now, other given information, it wasn't directly stated, but it's implied. The volume is one-third pi r squared h. That would be the volume of my cone. And in this case, notice over here, they used x as the radius and y as the height of that liquid. So I'm going to convert that over to be consistent with what they have in the diagram. So one-third pi x squared y. Okay, so now let's think about what we're trying to find. Well, what we want to find this time, based on those variables, I want to find the rate at which the level of the liquid in the cup is changing. So I want to find dy dt when the liquid is 6 centimeters deep. So I want that at the point that y is equal to 6 centimeters. Okay, so that's what I'm looking for. Now, there's some other things we can do with this problem. So typically what I would do at this point is I would just take the derivative of my volume with respect to time. But if you think about that, when I take the derivative here, I'm going to have to do product rule. I'm going to end up with a dx dt and a dy dt. That would be okay, but it's actually making the problem a little bit harder for me because I'd have to go about it in a little bit different way. So since I don't really have information about dx dt, what I would like to be able to do is eliminate x from this entire scenario. And we have enough information in this diagram to allow us to do that. So that's what I'm going to do here is take a look at this diagram and I'm going to just see if I can come up with a relationship between x and y. So notice at the top of the cup, the radius here would be four centimeters. Okay, so I have a relationship between the radius and the height of the cup. I also have a radius and the height of the water here. Now, if you look at that, what I really have are similar triangles. So they share that angle. They both have a right angle. So remembering from geometry, angle, angle, similarity, that's what I'm going to use for this. So I'm going to use the ratio of the radius to the height, x over y, has to be the same as the ratio of the radius of the entire cone to the height of the entire cone. So that's the same as 4 over 10. Now remember, we want to try to get rid of our x. So I want to get x in terms of y. x is the same as 2 fifths of y. So that relationship wasn't directly stated, but with the information that was given in the problem, we're able to come up with a way to simplify our volume function out so that we can then simplify what we're going to do when we start taking derivatives here. So I'm going to rewrite my volume function. One-third pi. Remember we said x was two-fifths y. So two-fifths y squared times y. So now I've got my volume in terms of a single variable. And I can simplify this down. This would be the same as um, 4 over 75 pi y cubed. Okay, so that is my volume. Again, same volume I had before, just written in a different form. Okay, so remember, we're trying to find dy dt when y is equal to 6. Well, I know dv dt, and I'm trying to find dy dt. So that's really everything that I need. So I'm going to go ahead and take my derivative here. dv dt would be equal to 12 over 75 pi y squared times dy dt. Okay, so now let's think about what we want here. We want dy dt. We know y, we know dv dt. So that's really everything that we need. So let me solve for dy dt. dy dt is the same as dv dt divided by 12 over 75 pi y squared. Okay, so all I did was rearrange that equation. And now if I want dy dt when 
y is equal to 6, I'm going to plug in everything that I know. So dy dt when y is equal to 6 would be equal to, remember dv dt was negative 7, divided by 12 over 75 pi times 6 squared. And what that'll simplify down into, I'm not going to go through all of the number operations here, but what that'll sim sim uh, simplify down to is negative 175 over 144 pi centimeters per second. Now, in terms of being able to quantify, does that seem reasonable? That is our exact solution. But for me to think about whether or not the solution is reasonable, I probably want to think about this as a decimal. That's about negative 0.387 centimeters per second. Okay, so now let's think about our solution here. First of all, does it make sense that our solution is negative? The answer would be yes. It definitely makes sense that it's negative because the level of the liquid in the cup is going to decrease as we decrease the volume. Um, the second thing, look at your units. So again, with the units, remember the negative 7 here was in seven was uh, centimeters cubed per second. And then the 6 down here was in centimeters. So we're dividing centimeters cubed per second by centimeters squared, and we end up with centimeters per second. The other thing is I'm at roughly negative 0.4 centimeters per second. Um, that's the rate that the level of the liquid in the cup is decreasing. That seems like a reasonable rate, 0.4 centimeters per second. It doesn't seem like it's going too fast or way, way, way too slow. Um, so again, seems like a reasonable answer. Okay, so that's sort of the main idea. A little more complicated that time. We had to know volume equation. We had to know some stuff with geometry. Uh, and then the calculus piece of this, this is always what's interesting to me on these questions. If you look at this entire problem, the only step where we actually did calculus was this step right here. So on that step, we took the derivative. All the rest of this problem was actually just the setup, the stuff we did with geometry, the stuff that we did with algebra to solve this out. So really, more than anything on these problems, it's going to be a test of how strong are you with all your prerequisite skills as opposed to how strong are your calculus skills. If you can get the function that you need, then the calculus piece of it will always be very, very small in comparison to everything else that you have to do in the problem. All right, let's look at the second part. So B, it says, um, at what rate is the level of the liquid in the cup changing at the instant when the last drop leaves the cup? Okay, so the instant when the last drop leaves the cup means Y would be zero. Well, remember, we had this relationship that we just found right here, and it's got a Y in the denominator. So that's my relationship between um, dy dt and dv dt. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to find dy dt at the point that y approaches 0. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to take the limit as y approaches 0 of dv dt over... And remember, we had that 12 over 75 pi y squared. Well, I'm going to go ahead and plug in my dv dt. That's the limit as y approaches 0 of negative 7 over 12 over 75 pi y squared. Now, really, we're approaching 0 from the right-hand side, right? So we're really just looking at a one-sided limit. And when I look at this from a one-sided limit perspective, what's going to happen with this, if you think about the graph of like a 1 over x squared, that graph's going to approach infinity, but we're multiplying by a negative. So what's going to happen with this is this value is going to approach negative infinity. So we're going to approach um, a value, a rate of change that approaches a negative infinite value. Now, clearly it's not going to be infinity, but that's theoretically what would be happening um, at the instant when the last drop leaves the cup. Okay, so um, as it pertains to these related rates questions, you have a lot of varied levels of difficulty. These can be as simple as the types of problems that I gave you at the beginning. 
to as complicated as this type of problem. This would be something that would be more like an AP free response question where, you know, this is intended to be about a 15 minute question. So the simpler ones could be questions that take a minute. So you just never know with these questions, you're going to go from something that's really, really simple to something that is pretty challenging. Um, this topic tends to be something that people find really difficult at first. The more of these you do, the more you'll start to feel comfortable with it and start to realize that if you follow our general strategy, it'll typically lead you to the solution that you're looking for. All right, so I have one more problem here I want you to try. This is an old AP test question, and this would be on the non-calculator multiple choice. Now, when these are multiple choice questions on the AP exam, they tend to be very, very simple. When they're free response, like the one we just looked at, they tend to be very difficult. So what I want you to do is just pause the video and I want you to try this problem. This is a non-calculator multiple choice question. So take about two minutes, give yourself about two minutes and see if you can solve this question out. When you're done, unpause the video and I'll show you the solution. Okay, so here's what you should have ended up with on that one. Um, notice I had the curve x, y is equal to 10. We're trying to find dx dt. Rather than trying to isolate y, I just went ahead and took the derivative in the form that it's in. So on the left side, I did the product rule, x dy dt plus y dx dt is equal to zero. And then from there, um, I solved for dx dt. Now notice the things that we know in this equation based on what's given. They told us x, they told us dy dt, they didn't tell us the y value. However, we know that x, y is equal to 10, right? So if I know x is two, well then y has to be five. So that's all I did to solve the problem out. I plugged in five for y at that point and then just isolated dx dt and you get negative six over five. Okay, so not super difficult. Again, that's more of what the um, AP multiple choice style of question would look like. And like I said before, the one above would be more like something that would be like an AP free response type of question. So very, very different levels of difficulty depending on um, the type of problem that you're dealing with when it um, pertains to related rates. All right, so next time in class, we're gonna go through some more practice problems that are gonna give you a, a good sense for the types of questions I'm gonna expect you to know how to do in terms of level of difficulty. So the one that we did up here, that's about as difficult of a question as I would ever give you. Um, if you're not careful looking through the textbook, some of the questions towards the end of the section get very, very difficult, far beyond what I would ask you to do. They're good to do for a challenge, but they're not something I would ever ask you to do on a quiz or a test or anything like that. So when you go through the Math Excel homework, it's going to start out very easy and it's going to sort of ramp up into what I would consider like mid-level difficulty. You'll never get into any that are super, super difficult. But what you will find is that there are a lot of different types of questions. So try to make sure that as a general rule, you're just following this strategy when you go through and you solve the problems.